Stephen Hawking, what's the image that comes into your mind when you hear his name? Do you think of an iconic scientist? Or do you think of him guest starring in The Simpsons, The Big Bang Theory, Star Trek? For a while, my 12-year-old thought that he was just a character in Big Bang Theory. She didn't believe he was a scientist. A Brief History of Time, as Herb says, one of the best-selling books of all time. How many in the audience have it, and how many have actually read it? What is a theory of everything? For those of you who've seen the movie, do you know what a theory of everything is? And why do we actually care? So I'm here really to tell you about the science of Stephen Hawking. So to talk about his science, I have to go back in time by about 100 years. So 100 years ago, Einstein really revolutionized science by his new theory of gravity, the theory of general relativity. People were not very good at picking names of theories at the beginning of the 20th century. So what he told us is that the space and time are shaped by the matter and the energy in the universe. The picture that you see here shows how the Earth curves the space around it. The moon you know, is pulled around the Earth because of the curvature of space. It was a revolutionary theory. But Einstein wasn't prepared to throw away all the sort of perceptions that people have had. He thought that the universe needed to be approximately constant in time. He thought that the universe had a fixed number of galaxies. They'd been there for all time. Somehow the universe, you know, it just appeared one day and just sat there. But at the beginning of the 20th century, people were getting better with telescopes. In the 1920s, Hubble discovered that this couldn't be true. He discovered that galaxies were actually moving apart. The distance between galaxies had increased with time. Now imagine looking back in time to the early universe. That meant that the very early universe, the galaxies must have been very close together. It must have been really hot and dense. The universe must have been changing. Looking back at this, it's amazing to me that at the beginning of the 20th century, people thought that, you know, the universe would be just steady state, staying there in time. You know, in the 19th century, we understood through the theories of evolution, you know, the evolution of biological species, and yet Einstein thought that somehow the universe was just sitting there. But, you know, still, even by the 1950s, 1960s, people were finding ways to rescue this steady state of ideas. This was pretty much um, dropped by the discovery of Penzias and Wilson of the cosmic microwave background in 1964. They discovered it by accident, but they discovered that throughout the universe, there's this background radiation. And it originates from the time when the atoms were first formed in the universe. And really, the existence of this radiation confirms the fact that the universe must have been much smaller in the past, that it's getting bigger and bigger as, it, as time goes on. So the 1960s, that takes us to Stephen Hawking. So the picture that is shown there is from him in the 1960s when he was studying Cambridge with his close collaborator, Sir Roger Penrose. And what they found at that time is that the universe has a beginning. They showed definitively with their mathematical theories that the universe had a Big Bang. It's really appropriate for Stephen to be in the Big Bang theory, right, when it was him who really, you know, cemented this theory. They definitively ruled out the idea that the universe could be in a steady state. Hawking and Penrose were also very interested in black holes. They showed that so-called singularities arise in black holes. A singularity is when the laws of physics don't seem to apply. You need new laws of physics. And their work really implied that you needed a new theory of everything to understand the black holes, to understand what happened in the early universe. So what are black holes? Um, many of you will be experts from watching Doctor Who, from watching Interstellar. But what are black holes to physicists, to scientists? So they are things which have such strong gravity that nothing can escape. Space and time slow down. So what you see visualized in movies like Interstellar is, is, is close to what we think is the reality. There's a, a kind of a surface, the event horizon, and as you go near there, your clocks, your watches will go crazy. Typically, a black hole is surrounded by a lot of kind of heavy stuff which is, is, is moving into it. And so the kind of image that you see here, which is somewhat familiar from the image in, in Interstellar, the movie, is sort of showing all the things spiraling down into the black hole. Now, Stephen's biggest discovery, and the discovery that is commemorated in Westminster Abbey where he's interred, his biggest discovery 
was Hawking radiation. So what he showed is that when you take into account quantum effects, things can actually get out from the black hole. Quantum, quantum world is very strange, right? There's a small probability of things happening due to quantum effects. And so the particles can come out really, really slowly. They evaporate over billions of years. So this is the thing he's most proud of. And yet again, it leads him into understanding a theory of everything. So really, he spent the rest of his career from the 1970s through to when he passed away in 2018 working on a theory of everything, needed to understand the origin and fate of the black holes, needed to understand the origin and fate of the universe. It's the ultimate theory of physics. So Stephen and I worked together very much on the quantum physics of black holes. So the question that we were thinking about and working on is, if something goes into a black hole, what happens to the information that it contains? So whether you throw your old computer or whether you, you throw yourself with all your memories, all your history, what happens to that? And we were, we were theoretical scientists, so we could do thought experiments. We could jump from the beginning of the universe to the end of time. This is a wonderful thing about being a theorist, right? You know, you've got the freedom of the whole universe for your experiments. So what do we understand is happening in black holes now? So what we understand is the following. So black holes are really acting as giant quantum computer hard disks. As something goes into a black hole, it gets stored as information on the black hole surface. So this image, which was drawn for me by a very, very talented graphic artist, Oliver Dean, actually tries to illustrate this. So your, your astronaut falling into the surface of the black hole, shown in black. The information is imprinted on the surface of the black hole. And what goes in eventually comes out in this infamous Hawking radiation. So the Hawking radiation contains information about what fell into the black hole, how the black hole was formed. It can kind of tell you right back to what happened at the beginning of time. Now, some of you looking around the room may think, this is all great, but why should we care? Right, this is esoteric physics, you know, exotic periods of the universe, the beginning of the universe inside black holes. Why should you care? Well, it's because black holes help us to understand about the next generation of computers. So the computers of the end of the 21st century will need to be quantum computers. We need to harness the power of quantum physics to really get the next generation, the future generations of computers. And black holes are actually believed to be the, really the most efficient computers that nature can provide. So the kind of experiments that we're doing with black holes actually help us in making quantum computers, kind of quantum computers that you could carry around in your pocket, a reality. And so Hawking's discoveries from the 1970s are still driving the frontiers of physics and linking across into perhaps the future of technology. So let me conclude with a few words about working with Stephen. So I was um, a student of Stephen Hawking for three years, and then I had the privilege of working with him as a research fellow for another three years. He was somebody who didn't take no for an answer. He always thought beyond boundaries. The picture on the right-hand side is something he was very, very proud of. He was able to go up in orbit, and he could experience moving around being weightless. He really would never give in. However hard a problem was, he always wanted to keep trying. He, he was somebody who had enormous resilience. So the quote that you see on this slide, I'm not going to read it out word for word, but for me, it really captures his spirit. And it was a great privilege for me to be able to work with him. Thank you very much. <laughs>